Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. Understanding Sin and Its Causes is the fourth assistance group in the Education and Love series. In this presentation, titled Creation of Sin Q&A, Jesus and Mary answer written questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Creation of Sin. Recorded on the 23rd of February 2019 from 12.15pm in Nooseville, Queensland, Australia. Okay. Well, the uh, title of this session is Creation of Sin Q&A. And you've given us a monster list of questions, so it's really good. It's lovely. I don't know how I'm going to go, but I'm going to try to answer the 10 or so that I have in my hand through the session, but we'll see how we go. We should be finished. What's our time for finishing this particular thing? Can anybody just tell me that? We're already half an hour. We're late, already half so. an hour, over, aren't we? So. In 10 minutes' time, yeah, we're supposed to finish. We're finishing. <laughs> Ten questions in ten minutes. And you've got to run to the seat as well. It's like a, a variation on musical chairs. And next one. <laughs> yes, well, ten questions in ten minutes. I'm not sure how I'm going to go with that. But let's get started straight away, shall we? Uh, Paige, can we have you first in the hot seat? Thank you. Now, Paige has asked this question. She said, please explain with examples what is meant by the two states that cause sin, whether acted upon or not, and that is the existence of will and desire out of harmony with God's love and principles or the absence of will and desire in harmony with God's love and principles. Is the effect of both of these states the same from God's perspective, whether acted upon or not? And then she clarifies by saying, meaning is the damage caused to self, others and the environment the same for both sins of commission and sins of omission. So basically, you're asking, it seems, Paige, that you want to know whether the damages caused by sins of commission are similar to the damages caused by sins of omission. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Is that the full extent of that question? No, because I... I starting to read the outlines, I was hit right at that first definition. It's like, I've got no bloody idea what either of these really mean. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Particularly with the absence as well. Yeah. Well, maybe if I give some examples, that would probably be a good hand. Yeah, so. Why don't I manage the um, cards? Don't so, so, yeah, you if you can to. just manage the orders. Those are Back ones ups. I'd like to yep. get to. These are ones that I'll probably get to. Yep. But we'll see how we go. All right, so, so the real issue is, okay, we've got sins of omission, so let's uh, just uh, write that down. Let's start with commission and omission. Now, to put it quite simply, commission means we're doing something that's directly against the law. And omission is we're trying to not do something Right? In other words, we're trying to avoid something, but doing it would be in harmony with the law. You follow? Yeah, I do that one a lot. Yeah, so mo a lot of people don't realise that, you know, these two, you know, we often overlook these kinds of sins, don't we? Where we could have done something positive in the situation, but we didn't. A common one is this. Here's an example of a sin of omission. You've got an opportunity to tell the truth, but you don't. That's a sin of omission. Now, most of us probably do that in the course of a day quite a few times, right? Yep. Now, the question then becomes, well, how dangerous is that? Well, that can be very dangerous if you think about it. So, for example, someone's speeding along in a car and they're down the end of the road there, there's a great big hole in a road. And you know the hole in a road exists Right? And so you could run back up the road, but because you're in a bit of a hurry, you decide 
Now I'm going to, I'm just going to let the other person discover the way I did. Right? That could kill the person. That's a pretty serious sin of omission, isn't it? It could result in somebody's death. And how far away is that from murder? Not very far, really. Because it was a purposeful choice to not inform somebody that they potentially might die if they do something. Right? So how serious is a sin of omission? Well, it depends on the circumstance, doesn't it? How serious it can get. It could get very, very serious, a sin of omission, to the point where it almost is the same as a sin of commission in terms of its severity. Right? Now, there are plenty of people who know that if they did something that uh, it would save somebody or help somebody and they choose to not do it. Now, God treats those kind of sins as pretty serious. Right? Yep. So we've got to start seeing sin as commission, which is a, like my purposeful act to sin. So this is, I basically desire to sin and I go ahead and do it. Whatever it could be that my will is set to sin that way, or it could be that I actually want to, uh, you know, desire it. It might be might not have anything to do with my will, but it just might be my desire. Curiosity is one of those kind of things, isn't it? Sometimes, with commission, we become curious about a certain type of activity that looks attractive to us on the outside. We've never done it before, but it looks attractive, and so we end up doing it. Now, in our teenage years, that happens a lot. You know, where you might not have had any sexual activity whatsoever in your life but you see a certain person's engaging in certain times of sexual activity and you think oh maybe i could do that you know we're curious about what it might feel like and so forth and so what do we do we choose to go ahead and do it without considering consequences right that's an example where we hadn't sinned like that in the past but we developed a desire and away we go and do it right sins of commission and sins of omission can be very similar in their severity. Yep. Could we point out also that the sin of omission is actually an act? When we choose not to act, we are taking We are an making action. a choice, a yep. decision. There's a choice in our soul that we've made yep. when we know the right thing to do and we choose not to. Yeah, yeah. And it is by far the most severe way in which the majority of the Western world sins. To be honest, yeah, you know, there's a lot of bad things happening in the world in different part countries that we historically have raped the resources of, and yet we do very little to stop it. We just go sort of out of sight, out of mind. We, we're not going to do that. It's all too hard to solve now, and so we forget about even trying to address the issue at all. Another thing we do that with is the environment. Quite a lot, we go, well, the environment's destroyed now. What can I do about it? I didn't destroy it, but what can I do about it? So that's the sin of omission. We could do something about it. We choose not to. It doesn't matter who destroyed it, does it? What matters is that somebody needs to be willing to fix it up. That's why I bought a property that was badly damaged. I knew the actions I'd taken in the past had committed those kind of da that kind of damage. You know, the amount of meat I've eaten, I've probably... You know, might have eaten 40 cows in my life, right? And so now where we are takes 40 acres, 40 cows around about. So I get my 40 acres and, man, it's heavily damaged. It's taken me, I don't know, 12 years of very hard work to get it to a place where it's in recovery, right? Most people are not willing to do that. They go, oh, that's somebody else's. I'll go and get that nice piece of land over there. And then what do we do with that? Generally, we don't damage that, right? We might not be eating that meat anymore, but, but it's a lot easier to fix up a nice place than it is to fix up one that's been cattle-driven, for example, for years and years and years. It's a bit like what we see when we travel over the rainforests in Brazil, you know. You, you go from rainforest to cattle country within the blink of an eye in some places, and the cattle country looks like the country where we lived where, where we, before I bought it. And it used to be a tropical rainforest. And it looks much the same as what Wilkesdale looks like out where we live. And it's just amazing the damage we do. 
And yet we look at it and we go, it's all done now. To fix that is going to be costly time, costly resource, costly effort, costly. Nah, I don't want to do that. I want to spend my life doing some more comfortable things than that, right? It's a sin of omission. A lot of the things continue to happen on the planet because of sins of omission. So we've got to be pretty hot on sins of omission. And God's laws are very, very much equally focused on both kinds of sins. Hmm. Our passivity, like Jesus was talking about, about the car that just sits and rots for a thousand years. You know, when we do that in our soul, when we just become passive, there are thousands and thousands of sins of omission that we are creating, that we are committing every day. Mm. Because that's quite a sinful state. Yeah. 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 So it's far better to see what is right, you know, and, and take action to do it to the best of your ability. God doesn't expect you to kill yourself doing it, of course. But God does expect you to use your resources, your time, your energy, your effort to at least undo the things you've contributed to in the past. Yeah. So when it comes to the question, you can see why there's two parts to sin. There's the commission and the omission. The commission is quite obvious to most people. The omission, not so obvious. And yet just as serious and can be very, very serious, actually. There are many people who have murdered other people in God's eyes by just not telling other people the truth. Yep. And you asked, Paige, is the effect of both these states the same from God's perspective, whether acted on or not? While we've used commission and omission to help you guys understand the complexity of sin, God doesn't measure things like, oh, that's a commission one, that's an omission one, you know. It's very, very scientific and, and precise, the yeah. measurement of your soul at any one point. So, yes, I understand the fears that have driven the question <laughs> and the resistance that's driven the question. Um, but, yeah, it's not quite as cut and dry. So, yeah. yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Stay. Okay. Stay. Paige, you're staying for the next one. <laughs> It was not by choice, it was just the way it's worked out. Number one question you asked here was about God wanting me to talk about my sin. You said, why does God want me to talk about my sin with others? Now, yes, yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because a lot of times when we say something like that, people go, oh, you're just trying to expose me to embarrassment and humiliation, you know? And that's not the reason why. Can you come up with ideas of your, of your own as to why God would want you to talk about your sin with others? Well, potentially can help people. Well, it can help who? Myself. Yourself, in the sense that while you're explaining something to somebody, you start having openness, don't you, to ideas and concepts which they can then share with you or even God or God's helping spirits can share with you so you can, you can receive information this way. So you might, in the point of discussion, be close to hearing something through your conscience. But when you, you know, have a discussion with somebody, now you're a bit open to the whole thing. And now, oh, ideas get presented to you, which you might not have presented to before. Now, we've got to be careful who we're talking to, don't we? Why? Well, that was part of my question. Yeah. If the person's judgmental, if the person wants to use our sins against us or they want to attack us for our sin, then are they loving? No. Is it wise to discuss your problems with anybody of that kind? No. No, obviously not, right? So here we're not encouraging you. It's not a carte blanche to go talk to everybody about your sin. <laughs> what we're suggesting is you need to choose people who have gone through those particular problems and come out the other end who have actually gone through resolution, you know, it's no good talking to somebody who's got no idea about the issue, but also it's no good talking to somebody who's going to use your sins against you at some point in the future just for the point of attacking you or pulling you down. Or you could say it this way, it's no good putting yourself in a position where other people feel induced to sin because of your exposure of your own sin. Yes. Make sense? 
that's what I wanted to mention about the also, and you, I think you mentioned it in your questions there, Paige, about addiction. So if I'm seeking to talk about my sin with someone and it's just to gain commiseration, to help me avoid shame, to help me to go, yeah, we all do it and yeah, well, that's life. Oh, you poor girl, you- <laughs> everything will be right. <laughs> then obviously that's not a sincere motivation to talk about my sin. I would talk about my sin with someone if I felt very strongly inside of myself, this is a sin. I'm not going to be moved on that and I know it's my responsibility to change it and I'm, I'm going to talk about it because it's a part of my experience, it's a part of who I am, but I'll be discerning about who I talk about it with and I won't be talking about it to just gain attention or commiseration or to support someone else's sin and say, oh, don't worry, I did that too. What we're referring to in that discussion that Jesus was just having with you is just talking about sin in a really sincere, authentic way when we've made some decisions about sin inside of ourselves and also talking to people about sin who have some experience with dealing with sin. Yeah. Hmm. You've asked what it looks like in daily life to talk about a sin with others. Well, that's something that our little team out home experiences every day, don't we? It's like we're all pretty open about what's going on and what we've done wrong. There's no judgment with everybody. We try to help each other see what the sin is and we try to also help people work through the sins. But if they don't work through them, we give them time to work through them. Obviously, if they don't work through them at all, then we've got to start going, well, hang on a sec, you just don't want to work through them now. You know, because the reality is sin is able to be removed. So if you haven't removed it over years, then the question now becomes, do you really want to? Is there a true desire or are you just talking about it? Every conversation has authenticity and realism in it when you do. And that's what we like about our team that we have got going now. There's about 10 to 12 people working in a team at home on different projects. Every one of them has things exposed to them pretty much every day. You might feel bad when you have it exposed, but there's no judgment coming at you by the rest of the team because everybody knows that we all sin. So in well, those correct. interactions, sometimes we're like owning up to our own sin and saying, look, actually I, was, I did something like wrong there. I made that decision because I was afraid and I wanted your approval or whatever. Or sometimes it's other members of the team saying to each other, hey, (laughs) you're not really connected with the job here. You need to have a look at something. So we're talking to each other about our sin constantly in a very natural, free-flowing way, along with talking about, do you like those mangoes? You know, whatever. (laughs) But but we also still get the job done. Yes. People like talking a lot without doing anything. All the people involved in our team are all doers. You know, we don't, we don't hang around talking for no purpose. Well, that's the addictive part, that, and yeah. that's what you're alluding to here because yeah. it isn't healthy just for everyone to stand around and just talk about their sin all afternoon and then go home and just do the same sin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it is a very nice environment, to be honest. If we all here got into the same environment, you wouldn't feel judged by anybody, you don't know, feel criticised by anybody. It's easier to face your issues and your problems and it's easier to also see them more clearly and to do something about them as well. I find it's much easier to examine my own condition when other people are willing to be real about their condition and me real with them because we can all go, what's happening in this interaction? What am I feeling? What are you? And we, but we're not talking about it. We're just sensitive and aware of that and pointing things out to each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it can it can be a really nice environment, and it is a really nice environment. It's very hard for people to get used to up front, generally, because they have so much personal judgment, and they think that anything being said to them is a judgment, and so then they get you know often get angry or resentful and so forth, and and that then makes it a lot more complicated, obviously. But after a person is used to doing it and is a bit more humble and open to their own emotional experience. And yeah, it can, be, it can be a very freeing process of being able to just discuss what's wrong and then move on, you know, next thing, next thing. And if it crops up again and again, the same thing wrong, 
then discuss why it's cropping up more than once. <laughs> you know, why is it cropping up today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day after, and the next week after, and the next month after? There's obviously not much of an imperative to deal with the problem. Then you've got to get a bit more firm about, oh, is this problem ever going to be addressed? Or do we all have to be putting up with this problem from you for the rest of our lives? Because that's not what we want to do here, right? Yeah, so it's very good. Hmm. All right, thanks for your questions, Paige. Anita, where are you? Want to come down into the hot seat, Anita? Thank you. G'day, how are you? you? Just hold that mic up. Yeah. Which mechanisms has God put within and outside of our human souls to assist removal of sin? Was the question you asked. Yeah. yeah a few yeah. people asked this question. Now, lots so. of you asked this yeah. question, did you not? So, yeah. so it's a common question. There, there was about 15 people, I think, with that same <laughs> question. So it's a very good question. Okay. Now, obviously, um, I can't list them all because the human soul is a very complicated piece of machinery <laughs> for a start. And for us to list every single like mechanism, we'd be here for days and days listing these mechanisms, right? But I can mention a few that we've already talked about that you have not yet seen as a mechanism, right? So, so let's do that. And then also outside of our soul to assist us, we'll, we'll look at some of those mechanisms too. So let's look firstly inside the soul. God's a very clever designer, of course. So we we'll just look firstly inside the soul. So this is mechanisms inside the soul. We just need to look at uh, some of the primary mechanisms inside the soul. Okay, number one primary mechanism inside of the soul. What is prayer? Prayer is the heartfelt longing directed to God for a specific thing, isn't it? Whatever the specific thing is. Okay. So why is that a mechanism of the soul? What, what happens when you pray is that a heartfelt longing opens your heart. What it does is it opens pathways inside of your soul. Technically, this is what it does. It opens pathways inside your soul that allows new information to flow in those pathways. So if you could sort of picture your soul like this, right? And, and let's say your sin is like this. Your sin creates like sort of a blockages across, right? Different types of sin creates different types of blockages across your soul. So when you're talking about the flow of energy, so if the blue is the energy, the energy is flowing down through your soul. But now it's got to go, you know, find its way, and then some places are completely blocked, right? Like that. And it can't go any further than that in that, in that moment. The emotional energy... And remember, energy can come from other people in the universe, God. But also love is an energy that God has that can flow through your soul. But if it finds a blockage, you know, which sin has been instrumental in creating, what does it do? It's, it can't flow anymore, right? What does prayer do? Well, if we're praying about this particular problem, there is a, what you would cl classify as an opening in the soul in that particular moment. And if, if you can examine it uh, physically, what it looks like is like a pathway cut through the blockage, right? That's physically what happens inside your soul emotionally. A pathway is cut through the blockage that now allows some of the energy to flow through. And like all energy, any energy that opposes other energy eventually has an erosion effect, if you like, upon that energy. So eventually that hole has the potential to get wider and wider and wider if we let it. But without the longing, none of that can happen. So the longing mechanism in the soul cannot be overestimated. It is one of the most powerful forces that exists within your soul for change. So you could say longing is desire, couldn't you? Yep, true, sincere desire. So mechanism number one. Mechanism number two, very important mechanism that very few people on earth really understand is faith. We talk more about faith later in terms of this group when we talk about corrupted faith. But what is faith? Faith is a belief that in the future something is possible. Now, how does that create an opening in your soul? Well, 
if you don't believe anything is possible, can you see you're not going to ever do anything about it? Do you understand what I mean by that? So, so for example, let's say I gave you a musical instrument. I've got a guitar at the back, not down here with me. I give you a guitar, and you've never played a guitar. And so I say, Anita, you can play this guitar, right? And you go, it's not possible. Are you going to even try? No, you're not, are you? You're just going to sit on it. You, you might look at the guitar and feel like you're useless and all those other feelings you might have. You're not going to touch the guitar, are you? Right? But if you had faith that it is possible for you to learn a guitar, what will you do? I'd try. Yeah, you'd yeah. pick it up, wouldn't you? And you go ding, 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 you know. Initially, that's what I did. You know, it's ding, 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 ding. You know, it took me uh, about 10 weeks, you know, the first few weeks it was like clumsy 10-finger clumsiness, you know what I mean? And after a little while, oh, oh, I remember the very first time it happened to me where I was watching these notes and I'm going bing, 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 bing. You know, I was learning classical guitar and, and you know, just not getting this at all. And then all of a sudden it was just like bang. It just all clicked for some reason, right? And that was an amazing time because what was possible, I thought might be possible, became reality to a small degree. And that, of course, built my faith, right? But initially I had to have some faith yeah. that it was possible. So faith is a big, has a big effect on your soul. The third thing that is very, very important as a mechanism in your soul is emotion. Now God created an emotion for specific purposes. Obviously, one of the reasons why God created emotion is that you cannot really have any joyful experience without an emotion, right? So it's sort of like emotion is like the difference between a robot and a human, you could say. The robot ha still might be able to do the same thing, but it doesn't feel the same thing while it's doing it because it has no feelings, right? Emotion gives us the ability to have experiences that have impact upon us emotionally. And so emotion is a, is a mechanism that God inbuilt into the soul in order for you, as we say saying here, to remove our sin. Now, you can think, we take an action, we sin. Right? Now the sin exists within us. Emotion can help us get rid of that sin. Right? By experiencing an emotion, we can get rid of that sin. So emotions are very important to the removal of sin. And this is why we've spent so much time with you over years and years now trying to help you with your emotions because they're a very important mechanism of the soul to help you remove sin. Right? So they're, they're inside the soul. There's just a few. Right? Outside the soul. So what are the mechanisms outside the soul? Well, the very first thing is that how God created the flowing of energy in the universe. Right? So we call it. Now, what God did was he created a mathematical structure through which everything could be measured. And this is very, very important for the removal of sin because without there being a mathematical structure, there'd be no way to measure that you've got rid of a sin. Can you see that? Remember we said in the third group that laws all measured the emotion that flows in the soul or the condition of the soul mathematically through the energy flow, the different types of energy that flow in the soul. The law measures it. So here what we're saying is, right, the universe is measuring the energy flowing in and out of your soul. It knows every emotion flowing in and every emotion flowing out and it measures that flow. Its type of flow, the type of energy, is all quantifiable through mathematics, right? Now, the fact that it's all mathematical means that when a certain type of emotion flows out of your soul, right, and that carries with it the sin, what happens is the universe now knows that you are now sinless on that matter. The laws all know that that is no longer something that will interact with those laws anymore. Because remember, 
The sin interacts, is an energy signature that interacts with the law. That's how the law knows you sin, by measuring the mathematics of it all. So if you think about it uh, from, a, from a gravitational perspective, the force of gravity is a law upon your body, right? It's a pull, if you like, upon your body. And so it, and I'm using terms very loosely here. I know a lot of scientists would you know, be upset about me calling it a force or whatever, but let's just lose it, use it very loosely as we generally sort of understand. It's a force pulling on my body. If I break that law, there's an instant response by the force, right? The force measures my attempt to break it. And depending on the severity of my attempt to break it will depend on the severity of the result upon my body. My body has a certain limitation and any action I take will cause a degradation of the body if I exceed the design limitations of my physical form. The law is really saying you've now exceeded the ability for the body to sustain its own life when we get to a severe uh, breaking of this particular law to exceed its ability for the physical mechanisms within the body to function anymore. They can't function anymore when we break the law to a severe degree. Right? And so when we jump off a 10-storey building, we hit the ground head first, highly likely we're going to pass instantly. right? And the reason for that is quite clear. The body has been designed to not do those kind of things to not jump off of buildings 10 stories high and then hit the ground head first. The body is an instrument that has limitations and the law is created to help us to understand those limitations. And the law measures the flow of energy between, in this case, the physical form and the law itself uh, interacting with each other in order to create the final result, which is do we stay stuck to the ground, which is a good thing, or do we climb up a big building and jump off the thing, which is a bad thing? Right? The same kind of things apply spiritually and emotionally. So the law measures everything coming out of our soul and then applies everything mathematically to see what the law, how the law will respond to what's coming out of our soul. So without this energy flow in the universe that's mathematically defined, there would be no definition of sin no way to measure sin, no way to measure the type of sin, no way to measure that the sin has actually been removed. So there's an external force, if you like, that God created, a framework for the soul to exist that is external to ourselves that will help us remove sin. Right? Now, of course, there's other more obvious ones. Right? So such things like you know, other people. Others are external to ourselves. And yet they can have a great influence on us removing sin by just explaining how to do it and telling us what is a sin and what isn't, right? whether those others are spirits or God or other people. And that's a great influence too. So does that give you an idea of the difference between yeah, yeah. internal, inside the soul mechanisms that God created, and then external, outside the soul mechanism, which are law-based mechanisms as well as people that can help us remove sin? Would that be law of attraction as well? Of course. If you look at all the laws, law of cause and effect, law of attraction, all of these different kinds of laws have all been created to help us remove sin and help us also maintain a pristine state of understanding what sin is. In other words, understanding when we've done something wrong. If the law did not respond to a sin, then we would not know what was wrong and what was right. You know, And that, that could be very damaging to us in, in terms of our happiness. So... You know, we want to do what's going to make us happy and we want to avoid what makes us unhappy, right? And that without the law's response, we wouldn't know which is which. We need the law to respond mathematically, consistently and permanently to the same action. These are God's external mechanisms. Make sense? Thank you. So also, and these, these uh, interactions between the, what's within our soul and the external way that the universe operates, there's the conscience mechanism that we've talked about recently in the Forgiveness and Repentance series. So if anyone would like to hear more about that, you can find that there. But that's a method of communication between ourselves and God, which can give us direct feedback about our sin, which can help us 
to remove our sin and even we can get information about how to remove our sin via our conscience. That's how Jesus received a lot of information in the first century. There's the various laws you mentioned, the law of attraction and the law of compensation. So they give us a lot of awareness that sin is happening or the type of sin we might be engaging in. And then there's also laws governing and allowing spirit communication. So from our soul to the soul of other spirits who can give us information about sin, spirits who've sinned in the same way we have. But as Jesus said in his introduction, there's just so many. (laughs) Yeah, as you'd expect, there's probably an infinite number of ways. (laughs) The soul has finite capacity, but obviously the, fi- the soul is capable of expanding as well. So you can have some mechanisms in the soul that you don't have today, but after you receive some of God's love, you will have tomorrow. So. And I always think, well, I, I feel that God loves us so much and God created us in this amazing playground of a universe and God really, really wants us to be happy. <laughs> it's an expression of God's love. And God wants us to understand how to use our free will to love ourselves and others. So God is going to build a lot of things into that environment and in ourselves for us to learn about sin and how to remove sin because sin is the cause of our pain and suffering. So, you know, God is pretty much everything that God's created has some mechanism to teach us about sin and how to remove sin. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next to next year is this one. Thalia. Thalia, do you want to go to the hot seat? Thank you. Just be careful walking in front of our video cams there. So the first part of your question was this, in what ways does God help us to remove sin? Well, you can see we've already talked about some what you call mechanisms. Yep. So this is what we just mentioned to Anita. Yep. The mechanisms that God uses ex- internal to the soul and external. So, so you could call those things creations of God that God uses to help us remove sin. But your question is more about like what does God personally do, right, isn't it, like to help us remove sin? Now, we've talked about two things that God does with you already, really, if you think about it, haven't we? The first thing is that we need to be open to truth, right? Mm -hmm. So how does truth come to us from God? Via the conscience. The conscience is an interesting mechanism because what what it is is it's an interplay between a mechanism of the soul that's inbuilt in our soul, right, which is a receptor of truth from God directly, right? And it also requires the, a, a transmitter, obviously, which is God, and then some kind of conduit, doesn't it? Some kind of energy flow between the two. The connection with, with the conscience is a very interesting connection because it involves three parties, really. It involves God, ourselves, and then this conduit that allows God to transmit information to ourselves directly like an electrical, you could call it like an electrical connection, you know. So the conscience is a mechanism that God uses to help us look at the issue of sin. And it's very powerful because what the conscience does is through the conscience, God has, us, has the ability to tell us directly what is right and what is wrong. Now, no other person ever existing really has that capability no matter what their condition. Now, sure, when a person gets into a celestial condition, they can tell us what is right and what is wrong, but they first had to learn that from God in the first place, right? So really it's coming from God anyway. God is the one who can tell you things that no one else can tell you, what is right and what is wrong, and that's physical things that are right and wrong, spiritual things right and wrong, uh, soul-based, love-based things that are right and wrong, morality things right and wrong. God can share every kind of truth through the mechanism of the soul, uh, through the mechanism of the conscience that exists in the soul and this conduit between yourself and God. This mechanism, most powerful mechanism that most people don't listen to very much because it's a very quiet mechanism. You have to be open to it in order to listen to it. If you're numbed out to sin, you know, which we often are, right? We're often numb 
by our sin. We, our sin numbs us out. And when we're numbed out to sin, we end up in this state where, you know, we're pretty numbed out to receiving anything via the conscience. The second mechanism, the most second, which which really flows from the conscience in a way, it's more powerful than conscience, but it needs the conscience initially in order to be engaged, and that is, uh, and I, and I'll explain that a bit more. What I mean by that is, truth needs to come to the human soul, emotionally, needs to come to the human soul before you, and I, here I'm saying you or I, before any person can actually start to believe in God's love being available to them. Do you follow? So the conscience is the mechanism by which God transmits truth. And the connection via the Holy Spirit, which is not, uh, you, could, you could say that is the conduit, there's a mechanism in the soul that connects to the Holy Spirit on one end and then the other end of the Holy Spirit is God's love being transmitted through that conduit and the Holy Spirit is the actual physical conduit, the pipe through which the love flows. That's the mechanism via which we receive love. Now, most people still don't really understand the power of God's love entering the soul because when it does, once it exists in your soul, it opens up pathways inside of your soul that never existed before. In fact, as your soul develops in God's love, even the major energy points of your soul change to such an extent that instead of having seven chakras, by the time you're in the eighth sphere, you have 13 chakras. right? And then from then on, it just increases more and more. right? There, there are more and more energy points crossover energy points that occur in your soul. So it's very interesting when you examine the way the soul works because God's love actually transforms the souls in a mechanical way to actually now allow you to do new things that you couldn't do before and understand things you couldn't understand before. And this is what most people don't get when we talk about God's love. They don't see it as a scientific process. They see it as a purely philosophical process. But it's actually a scientific process of changing the way the soul operates. right? And the soul now has the ability to connect to things that it could not connect to before. right? So they're God's two primary mechanisms. Of course, God has an unlimited number, an infinite number of mechanisms to help us but they are the two primary ones that we need to firstly focus our attention on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good uh, Saul, you want to come down to the hot seat? Thanks, Saul. Now, this will be our last question, unfortunately, because we're, we're way over our time. Sorry about that. So good question, Saul. You've asked, when removing multi-generational sin, am I dealing with the weight of the world's willingness to sin on that subject? Or do I just engage my own personal effects? Very good question. Yeah, very good question. The reality is you are dealing with the weight of the world <laughs> on the subject. This is why it's often difficult. I'll explain why. So here's you, uh, Saul going about his business, right? trying to uh, remove a sin of some kind. Now, but Saul has history, a history of ancestors, some of whom have passed. So we've got some spirit people. So draw them up. These are all your ancestors. And they're in spirit. They're spirits. They are trying to influence Saul. And if they haven't made a change yet on that same sin, they're going to be going, what are you doing, Saul? You're just being silly now. That's not a sin. That's not a problem. So they are already now trying to influence. It's like having people talking and saying, no, you're going the wrong direction now, mate. <laughs> you know? yep. So you've got them. They are ancestors in spirit. Then we've also got, obviously, another group of people. We draw them different colour just so we can, which are all of my family that is still alive.
and you say, ah, oh, mum, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that what I'm doing here is not so good. That's probably a sin, right? That's something I need to address. She's going, that's in me, right? She's going, hang on a sec. What Saul's just said is in him. That's in me. If it's in me, it can't be a sin. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to hear about that. So now she wants to put pressure on Saul and go, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. What are you talking about? You know, there's nothing, no, nothing bad there. So now they're having some effect on you now, right? Okay, now, now we've also got another group of people, haven't we, which are, you know, your mates and your friends. Yeah. Yep, so we'll call them your friends. We'll call them your friends, but, you know, let's just maybe call them your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Because a person who's truly your friend would help you remove your sin, right? Because they'd know your pain and suffering will reduce. But again, same kind of influence as our family still alive. They're going, hang on a sec, I like doing what Saul's now saying is a sin. You're a bit of an idiot, Saul, for thinking that's a sin, you know? And then they start putting a bit of pressure, emotional pressure on you, and sometimes even stronger pressure on you to change your mind on the subject. Then we've got... uh, what else have we got after that? I'm running out of colours, so I'll have to go back to my uh, purple colour. So we've got society generally, haven't we? So society generally. Now, yes, they, they all have a specific idea about this particular problem you might face. Sometimes it's in harmony with your idea, you know, your sinful idea. Other times it might be they have disagreement. And, but other times they might be complete, completely confused. You know, they might not know either way. But they're having an influence on you too. But as you'll learn later in our second group of discussions that we're going to have shortly with you in the couple of days' time, these are all things that we're calling influences. Yes. Right? And to be frank, while influences influence you, they do not motivate you. What motivates you is what's in you. So if you want to have your family like you, yeah. that's a feeling that's in you, needing your family to like you, now you'll listen to the influence. But if you don't care either way, you'll go, no, I want God's view on this, right? If you want your friends to continue liking you, which is a feeling in you, motivating you to accept the influence, then you will listen to those friends. But if you go, no, I don't care if I have no friends, right? I'm still going to address this particular issue, you can see that the friends won't matter. Their influence won't matter. If you feel that you've got to fit into society and that you need the approval of society, then the influence of society will enter you. But if you feel that you don't care about how society feels about you, then that influence won't move you or motivate you to change. Can you see the actual choices and decisions we make while these are all influences? So let's call them that. And they do act against us, don't they? They resist us. They are acting against us. And they continually provide us with opportunities to continue the sin, not to cease it. Usually. That's right. They, they actually want us, most of the time, the society wants us to sin because it fits in with their definition of what is right and what is wrong. So they want us to do it. Even though that is the case, and even though it's uncomfortable, the reality is what actually moves us to accept influences is our internal motivations Mm. so in a way you you really need to define yourself individually emotionally individually correct Mm. this is what god wants us to do he wants you to be an individual soul being individual soul is going to be the best benefit to the universe soul being a conformist to society friends family ancestors that's not going to be of benefit to the universe. God wants you to be what he created you to be, an individual. I find so many of my sins are very unoriginal. You know, I, 
feel like I'm just repeating what they did in Rome or any – I feel very unoriginal in that place. Mm. Yes, and, and you're not being an individual in that place because sin causes us to conform. I really like that play on words. I'm so unoriginal when I sin because it's true, isn't it? You, we're just doing what everyone else does. Yeah. Trust me, you're never going to invent a new form of sin. No. <laughs> the only way you can invent are, something new is to People have been do doing yourself. 150,000 years of sin and it's pretty unlikely you're going to make up a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You might sort of exceed them in capacity. <laughs> Perfect them. <laughs> Perfect you know, them, I hope not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, or you might exceed the number of times you did the sin, but the reality is you're not probably going to create a new one. But God wants you to be individual soul, right? Yeah, beautiful. So being individual soul actually means coming to understand that your internal motivations are in the end the thing that really drives you. And so this is a, this is a core thing that we'll be talking about again in the next session and again in the session after. Motive, what is the motive inside you is in the end what determines whether people influence you or not. And God can most support me as an individual. Exactly. He wants you to be the individual. And not only that, he knows too that you as an individual are the best you. That's the strongest you. That's the, that's the you he created you to be. That is also the time Saul can attract his other half, you being you, not being conforming. When you're conforming, Nobody recognises you. The other half of you is not going to recognise you while you're conforming to all the influences because you've got all these motives inside of you to do so. Now, some of those motives might be, I need to please my family, or I need to not feel alone. These are just feelings we need to feel and let them go so that we can be an individual. We want to encourage all of you to be individuals, not be conformists. right? But most of us are conforming to these other outside influences because of internal motivations that exist inside of us that we're yet to see as sinful, right? So a desire to please my family at all costs is actually a sinful motive for doing something. A desire to have friends, not caring about what those friends do or do to you, that's not very good from God's perspective, right? That's an internal motive to have friends at any cost. Yeah. It's not what. So God, God has to be your priority above all the other influences. Yes, and, and not only God, but see, God also wants you to be you. So being you needs to be a priority too. You follow? Yeah. God wants you to be you. So in your relationship with God, you get to realize, oh, God wants me to be me, not to conform to what everybody else wants me to be. And this is a wonderful thing once you realise it, because it means you don't have to worry about what anybody thinks of you anymore. And that can be a great help to you not sinning, actually, because many of our sins are committed in worry or fear about what other people think. Yeah, yeah. good question. Does that answer, because I know you have a second part there where you say, do I just engage my own effects? Does God treat us as individuals or as collectives? God created us as individuals. Even though Jesus and I have spoken about some of the global collective situations that are happening on the earth, wars and famines and even just the way our society works, they're just really a conglomeration, if you like, of all of the individuals sinning. So we have individual effects, yeah? Yes. So when these people try to influence you, God sees that as that their sin. And these people try to influence you, God sees that as their sin. These people try to affect you, God sees that as their sin. Right? You respond, your God sees it as your when sin. When you respond, that's your sin. Yeah. You can't say it's their sin. You can't say it's their sin because it's driven by a motive inside of you. Just like their desire to influence you is driven by a motive inside of them. Yeah. Make sense? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for having that Q&A with us. We're over time for the day, but so if we can come back at uh, quarter to two, is that okay with everyone? We're at lunchtime now, so you've got a lunch break. Quarter to two is when we'll come back. Sounds good.